thank you for having me, Steve. Thank you, Panky, and uh, everybody for, for really being so gracious to, um, to, to have me as part of the program. I know that as part of the sleep program, I have been invited to just give a little bit of a twist to the, the, the thinking of things, and I'm gonna give you that twist tonight. Uh, just my uh, disclosures and affiliations, those you don't, that, that don't know me, I've been in orthodontist since 1983 up here in Jersey. Um, and about uh, 2008, I read an article that started to change my mind. And when I say change my mind, that was from one ear to the other. Um, I, shortly after that, I had an empty space across the hall and converted into a classroom. And now we've been teaching the airway mini residency for um, eight years now uh, with my partner, Mark Cruz. So that's a disclosure. I will love to invite you to, to be part of that. Um, I um, have been teaching really only because uh, nobody else was talking about this stuff. And one thing led to another, and I, I, I've been happily uh, filling that role, uh, you know, as of late. Um, I do get honorarium for the myo, from the Myofunctional Research Company, which uh, is the maker of Myobrace. It happens to be a core part of my service, not the only part, and I have a very specific function for it. But, but I, I will uh, gladly say that the what that is and it doesn't have to be in terms of a brand but it is leading the way into our thinking and someday the thinking of training the muscles and breathing will be as common to dental hygiene as brushing teeth and flossing um, i also want to say that even though i have some things that aren't entirely complementary to say about organized dentistry i'm very much a part of organized dentistry, both the American Dental Association, and I was past president of my local group, and, and um, I'm very active with Steve, who's doing um, an amazing job working with the, cha the, the task force for children's airway health at the ADA, and I'm so happy to be working under him there. And I'm also an AAO member, and uh, you know, some of the AAO members, they're not so happy with me for the things that I'm seeing. So uh, that's, that's just fair warning. And uh, this slide actually wasn't intended for you. I, I just um, did a webinar two nights ago for the orthodontic residents at um, Montefiore Einstein Hospital up in the uh, Bronx, up here in New York. And I said, well, send me some questions because I want to know what you guys are thinking about, what, what you want to know. And these are the three questions that they sent me and I gave them answers. I'm gonna give the, you the answers too because I, I thought maybe this is a, a good way to lead into it. So they wanted to know about the screening process. They've heard about the pediatric sleep questionnaire and checking for tonsils and that kind of stuff. My answer was for the screening process, if the teeth are not perfect, there are inevitably risk factors for flow limitation. In other words, in orthodontics, to me, the teeth are really not the problem anymore. But the fact that we have crooked teeth, which is relatively new in the human population, is associated with other factors that are risk factors for uh, flow limitation, that is, making it harder to breathe. I also recommended to them, and I'll recommend this to you as well, there are a couple of things that are happening, one at the ADA, we have a new short form uh, for um, uh, screening for sleep and breathing problems uh, for children and uh, to be used in practice. And as we disseminate that, that will become a standard part of practice. So we anticipate that hopefully this year that was supposed to be unveiled at the, uh, the meeting this, uh, this spring. And then the other one is look at sleepinventory.com. This is a validated sleep questionnaire. It's 30 questions. It's probably better va uh, validated than any of the others. And to my mind, it asks the right questions. So if you want a simple tool that you can use, you could even send this to mothers online 
they'll answer it and you'll get the results back online plus a graph and an explanation and so forth. I think that's a really good one. So jot that down. Um, they wanted to know about CBCT because the orthodontists that are involved in sleep, they love showing how the airway gets bigger in the CBCT. And um, while making an airway bigger is important, my answer to them, first of all, was that all metrics help, but no one metric ever tells it all. So, you know, we're always in our evidence-based thinking, we're always trying to eliminate, uh, to, to limit things down to smallest components so that we can isolate factors, right? But um, my feeling about this breathing and sleep thing is that it is so multifactorial that if you try to study any one of the factors, you really kind of lose perspective. And that happens to be true, I think, of medicine all around, that uh, we have been uh, so reductionist in our thinking that we've lost the emergent properties that occur when organization happens within the, the human body. In other words, you know, if you're familiar with that concept, you cannot predict the behavior of a chemical based on knowing the atoms alone. You cannot uh, predict the, um, the, uh, the, the behavior of a molecule uh, by, by looking at its basic uh, chemistry. You cannot predict the qualities of a cell by looking at its collection of chemicals. You can't predict the, the, the function of an organ or, or a system or a human by looking, breaking it down. And so there's a whole new way of looking at medicine now that is a little more, if you'll forgive the expression, holistic in that it, lo it looks at underlying causes and how they affect the whole being. The second thing I had to say there was that, you know, anatomy is an important piece. Um, yes, you can breathe better through a bubble tea straw than you can through a cocktail straw, but anatomy is only one factor. So I, it's fair warning, don't be fooled just by looking at uh, bigger airways on the CBCT. It's an important metric. It is a goal, but it's not everything. And then they wanted to know about what our role should be in sleep apnea. And, and this is the, the biggest part of the message and the one that I want to deliver to you tonight. And the one I deliver at the sleep uh, meeting uh, too is that sleep apnea itself is not really the problem. And this is a problem that the American Association of Orthodontists is having when it came out with its white paper a year and a half ago, you know, it, its so-called consensus statement, um, uh, is that they focus on sleep apnea. And sleep dentistry has been focused on sleep apnea because it's a medical condition for which we can help because of our skills in manipulating appliances and jaw position and so forth. But sleep apnea is itself an end stage disease of a much, much bigger problem. And it's that problem we're gonna to discuss tonight. And then finally, our role is, and this is uh, a, qu a quote from the policy statement from the ADA from 2017 regarding children, that it is our responsibility as dentists, mind you, to help develop an optimal physiologic airway and breathing pattern. I, 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 it's sort of the, uh, a long story short for me to tell you that after pursuing these ideas for eight years, when I read that the ADA came out with that statement, I, I nearly fell on the floor. My, my own jaw dropped open because I could not believe how prescient the ADA, which is not known for being risky or going out on a limb on anything, how, how forward thinking they were with this. And I encourage you to think about this. Um, both while I'm talking and, and you know, after as well. The optimal physiologic airway and breathing pattern. I'm gonna to describe to you what that means. Um, <clears throat> so I, I know everybody likes to show teeth, so I'm gonna do it and get it out of the way. Um, this is a nine-year-old and um, it, he comes in with what's essentially a very typical orthodontic problem. Um, you know, he's 
He's uh, like class one, class two uh, on one side, and midlines are off in a deep bite and some moderate crowding. And any, most orthodontists are going to look at this and say, yep, you're going to need orthodontics. Uh, uh, and mothers are going to look at this and say, yep, he's going to need orthodontics. And then they're going to say, we'll come back when the rest of the baby teeth fall out. We'll be able to do this in one stage, and, 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 and that's it. Well, also some orthodontists will say, you know, we can intercept this a little bit to, to catch some of that extra leeway space and mitigate the problems a little bit so that we can maybe do a little bit of expansion now and then we'll do the rest of the braces oh, uh, uh, afterwards. And it's been this constant battle in orthodontists where we polarize whether orthodontists need to do treatment in one phase or two phase. Orthodontists polarize around everything. They polarize around whether they should do extractions or not extractions, whether they should do fast expansion or slow expansion. And, you know, you, you can make yourself crazy trying to negotiate your way around the politics of people's opinions. And I got an opinion of my own. My opinion is all these polarizations, they don't mean a damn thing. They're all a red herring for the fact that something is happening to this child where his jaws are not forming properly, and that's why the teeth can't come in, but also his face is not forming properly, and to wit, his airway's not forming properly either. And to put a child like this on observation, as we say, you know, on hold before you do your orthodontics, whether it's one phase or two, and ignore the fact that this kid is suffering is medically indefensible. And this is, this is a really strong point because you know, while most orthodontists are arguing about one phase, two phase, traction, expansion, whatever, they're missing the point. This kid is sick and you can see it in his eyes and you can see it in his face and the mandible's not coming forward. His, his shoulders are uneven, his head is uneven and something is out of whack. And the, the one thing you can bet on that's a good sign of that is his crooked teeth. The crooked teeth are actually the body's solution for this imbalance that's going on because the body always seeks equilibrium and homeostasis. So um, uh, just to make a long story short, he's got, uh, he's got postural issues and imbalances. He's got tight frena and his tongue is bound down. His, his ankles are rolled in. He looks like he's uh, working three jobs, the poor kid. He's got nasal congestion and, and whatnot. Um, I, I do use the 3D cone beam. I think it's very helpful. I'm not saying it's not. When you see tonsils protruding out into the airway or uh, the airway getting extremely narrow in certain spots, if you see the tongue low, these are all signs. These are all risk factors for flow limitation problems. And I'll describe that in a bit. Uh, I think one of the greatest things about the CBCT is my ability to slice the front of the front half of the face off and look at the inside of the nose, the sinuses, and the alveolar processes, and across the palate, because this is really where the action is, the deficiency in growth of the maxilla is a keystone for what's going on to our faces. So when I can see things like swollen turbinates or uh, undersized um, uh, um, uh, sinuses, narrow jaws, uh, angulation of, of, um, uh, of molars that is off the, uh, the, 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 the true from, uh, you know, on, on the al alveolus. These are all things that are very helpful to see. Yes, we measure the volume and the minimal cross-sectional area of the airway. The volume doesn't mean a hill of beans, really. Uh, it may be good for research, you know, comparing T1 and T0, but the, the cross-sectional areas are important because anywhere there's a narrowing of the airway, that's where um, turbulence can be set up. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. So the narrowest spot is usually one of the culprits, but people can have more than one narrow spot. Between the tip of the nose and the bottom of the pharynx, Anything narrow is going to make airways, air swirl, and swirling air is hard to breathe through. Um, 
if you're if I have some orthodontists or orthodontists in the audience, you love tracing steps. I've kind of lost my uh, my feeling for that, and I'll tell you why. It's not just that I'm lazy; it's that uh, while cephalometrics has been um, looking at the shape of faces and describing various angles and lengths and so forth to describe where the child is at the moment they're sitting in your chair, it does nothing to tell you about how the face got there in the first place. And frankly, most of the uh, analyses that we use do not, to my mind, really describe the problem well. And there are some exceptions to that. But the one thing that I want to know is where is that upper incisor in relationship to the rest of the face? Because the, the upper incisor tends to be the emissary for the jaw. Where the, the, the uh, tooth goes, that's where the jaw's been or is. And, and if, the, if the jaw has not developed fully and it doesn't come forward in the face, the upper incisor will tend to be retracted or in some cases like this, it'll be pushed forward. But in orthodontics, when an orthodontist looks at an overjet like this of you know seven or eight millimeters, um, they're gonna ask this question. They're gonna say, all right, this is class two. Do I retract the upper incisors or do I advance the lower incisors? And, um, and there are various techniques that do both and some of the techniques just wind up halfway in between. But one of the things that I think we miss more than anything else is that if the maxilla is underdeveloped, that the maxilla, no matter the overjet, is also retrusive. And so most class twos are either uh, bimaxillary retrusive or mandibular retrusive, but not maxillary protrusive. There, in my mind, there is almost no good rationale for retracting the upper incisors anymore. And there are a couple exceptions to that, but think about, the, I, 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 this may sound crazy, but when I see a thumb sucker, to me, the, those teeth sticking out in the front they're probably the only two teeth in the right position in this face because everything else has been retarded by that habit. So uh, I know I, I probably shouldn't introduce myself to you with statements like that, but it is how I come to see things so differently. I do not want to retract incisors, no matter how I do it, in an airway that is already deficient in a face that's already deficient. Even if I have him protrude his jaw forward, that whole face is deficient. And this is an endemic in our population. Just as it's endemic for kids to have crooked teeth and normal for them to go to a, 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 a so normal for them to go to an orthodontist that most parents just lump it in with the sweet 16 the, and the, and the, and the uh, college tuition. But there's ample evidence that our birthright is not to have collapsed faces. And those are the joints, nothing particular there. And, and you know, I, I, I show this because I want to show that myofunctional treatment can make a difference. I'm going to be very forthright in telling you that this is an unusually good case. That even though it's a simple orthodontic case, by just training the muscles, and I, it was just really getting started, that we were able to start getting the tongue up on the roof of the mouth even before I got the tongue released and reduce the overbite, uh, started to widen the palate, reduce the crowding. I haven't done a, may I say it, damn thing other than that. There's no appliances, no bite plates, no, no uh, um, uh, turbos or anything. This was just him changing his muscles. And in five months, it's just the beginning. True growth modification takes time. It goes slowly. Teeth can respond fine, but faces take a long time to respond. And you have to be very patient in waiting for it. So one of my jobs in establishing good looking faces and good airways is to get started early and be there for the long haul. Uh, establish the habits that help the face grow properly. Get rid of the obstacles that make the face grow lousy. And then by the time the baby teeth fall out and the new ones come in, the face starts looking better, the teeth start looking better. And then if I have to do orthodontics, which I still have not done, please notice their primary, uh, primary molar on the upper left side. Uh, 
I have I I don't even know if I have to do orthodontics here, do I? And look at his face. See how the profile is starting to fill out, and he's still young. I got to make sure that we keep him growing in that that direction. Um, I'm less like a mechanic now than a supervisor or a teacher or or a a guider. A, just like a just like teachers in school. This is not just about mechanics. This is now about health and overall well-being and good growth. And that's where we need to go. All right, I'm going to skip this one just because I, I have so, so much material to show. Um, and let's get to the premise. And the premise is this, that um, there's been a change in the human skull in the past four or 500 years that's happened slow enough that either we don't see it or we don't wanna see it. And I'm gonna say we don't wanna see it because the lessons that it gives us can be a little bit disturbing. But also the possibilities and the opportunities that it gives us are amazing. And it, it goes like this. When you talk to an anthropologist, and, um, and there are many that are doing work on this right now, they will tell you that human skulls more than four or 500 years old have straight teeth and room for 32 teeth. Can you imagine how many in the audience have room for their wisdom teeth and room behind it and a big broad uh, face and, and strong jaws? Very, very few. That uh, the article of this uh, web, uh, you know, web post was our skulls are out evolving us. I'm actually gonna say our skulls are devolving us because the changes in this past four or 500 years have been a, a accompanied by a, an association with chronic diseases of all sorts. And it goes like this. Um, when any ancestral population that ha was eating ancestral food, so real food, stuff that had to be chewed, maybe the stuff that wasn't so much cooked or cut into pieces or Maybe it wasn't macerated and processed. Maybe it didn't have additives like uh, you know, antibiotics and pesticides and flavorings and colorings and, and sugar. Oh, sugar, yes. If all those things are added to the new source of food, when the population switches to that kind of diet, and it has happened in the last century in many places of this world, that within one generation, the teeth start to get crooked. And it goes beyond that. In the second generation, the onset of uh, metabolic disorders starts. Diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, the metabolic syndromes now that so many of us, including me, have uh, in, in, in the modern environment are all new. None of them had any frequency other than maybe, well, at least crooked teeth was three to 5% before we started processing sugar and then processing food. So how can you say that there's, you know, we get our crooked teeth from our parents? There are no genes for crooked teeth. It did not exist in the human genome with some very rare exceptions. One was a, a, a society in ancient Egypt where they were stone cutters and the air was constantly filled with dust. They had malformed jaws and crooked teeth. This is the work of Jerry Rose out of uh, U, Arkansas. Um, uh, I, I asked the students the other night, how many people knew this? And I asked this because, you know, I, I, I'm trying to come across some highfalutin expert, you know, the, oh, I, I come across with these new ideas. Nothing I am saying is mine. Nothing that I am saying is new. The pictures that you see in front of you and this concept of white man's face getting crooked and teeth are getting crooked was written about in 1878 by a, a, a Philadelphia lawyer named George Catlin who described, and he, he, his hobby was going out to the outback doing these paintings. He said that the Native Americans had beautiful full faces with straight teeth. And the kids back in Philadelphia looked terrible. In fact, the Indians used to call us black mouths. His book is fascinating and it's, it's, um, you know, it's free. This book was also recommended some 50 years later 
by none other than Edward Engel, the father of American orthodontics. It's called Shut Your Mouth and Save Your Life. And so this message, which we knew, that the father of orthodontics knew, that many orthodontists have known along the history of orthodontics, that our faces are not supposed to be deformed. We're not supposed to grow up with crooked teeth. This message has been lost. And if I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, my only message is to listen to the guys that I'm standing on because there is no excuse for this. Now, uh, I say no excuse. The, it is a cultural phenomenon now that we allow this to happen to our children. And, um, and I say that because we now know that it does not have to happen to our children. We can get our children out of this problem before it gets to the point where they need braces so badly anyway. I mean, I do braces for kids. Uh, not all kids turn out like that, that other case. And a lot of people still want that Hollywood snot smile, which is great. It's fun. I love straightening teeth but I'd rather have a child grow up and need as little of it as possible. Um, and the, 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 the further point is that the maxilla, which is so obviously collapsed in these upper, t uh, upper pictures, are not only a sign of uh, inadequate room for teeth, and that's why they have to squash in. Palate's also the floor of the nose, so the nasal apertures are already narrow before you even begin. So, that we're being born and raised with risk factors for flow limitation before we even start. So um, again, long story short, this left image is the way a face should look if it had the habits that encourage good growth, which are simply breathe through your nose, keep your lips together at rest, have your tongue resting on your palate, and be able to swallow without using your facial muscles. But for some reason, if you can't breathe through your nose, if your li lips are hanging open, if your tongue is low in the, root, in the floor of your mouth, the tongue, which is really a scaffold for the upper jaw, can't do its job. And so the maxilla starts to sag, and it sags in three dimensions of space. A lot of orthodontists think about jaws being narrow. Yes, they are. But really, the maxilla is collapsing in three dimensions of space. If you ever get a chance to look at the work of Mariana Evans, who's also doing some of this anthropolog anthropological work at Penn, she's a, an orthoperio dual degree, um, working particularly with developing maxillas in both gro you know, growing people and, and adults, but especially if you see the before and after of what human jaws look like, the way they're growing now, and what could be you uh, you could you just won't believe it, and I, I should have put those pictures in here, um, but it just jot her name down. You want to see it, because this is really the crux of the matter. If the tongue is not on the roof of the mouth while the jaw is growing, well, if we're not chewing food that really requires chewing, if we have allergies or asthma that makes our you know mouth hang open, our tongue is not doing right we have a deformed maxilla, and I call it a thumbprint palate, not from thumb sucking, but it looks like someone took their thumb and put it into a bunch of clay. That indentation there is, um, is, a, is evidence of a collapse along the sides. In other words, that's the right, that's the only spot that's correct is right up there on the top of the palate. Everything else is collapsed inward. And uh, the teeth become uh, malarranged because as they try to fight their way into inadequate space, they're gonna be guided by musculature along the sides, the buccinator, the orbicularosaurus, the mentalis, that are also often very active because of poor tongue posture. And the, the maxilla is gonna collapse in three dimensions of space. And you can see it at three years old. You can see it at seven years old. L look at that palate. This is one of my patients. And that is not an inherited condition. That is an acquired condition. And you can see it at eight years. These are not the same patients. I'm saying you can see it at every age because it does not go away by itself. And you have to understand this. It is a deformity. It is an acquired deformity of the human face based on poor posture, poor eating, 
and the stressors of the modern environment, the same ones that are creating problems for us elsewhere. This is what a, a good arch is supposed to look like on the right. The one on the left, even if you were to straighten up the teeth, that, that collapse in there would still be there. Now, I want you to start looking at your patients differently. Tilt their head back, have them open up their mouth, and look at the shape of the palate. If they had braces, they got straight teeth, I still want you to look because that means they straightened the teeth and compensated the teeth for a collapsed jaw and never got the, the tongue up to rest on the roof of the mouth where it should be. So um, we're gonna skip that. So the premise is this, that, um, um, that uh, through evolution, we survived and we're the only homo species still walking the planet that we know of. Um, that uh, we survived because we had developed certain physiologic competencies as well as behavioral competencies that helped us survive. Um, but in the modern environment that has changed so drastically, so fast, I mean, nothing has changed in human history like the modern environment since the Industrial Revolution. Look what's going on around us. We live in these incredible buildings with uh, you know, food and, 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 and clothing and, and, and things and internet and, uh, it, it, but it, none of it was there when our bodies developed. And so in one way or another, even though they have lots of benefits, they are also stressful. And, and I don't mean just psychologically stressful, physically stressful. Um, it, they, it, it's the way we use our bodies, the way we treat our bodies, the way we medicate our bodies, the, um, the things we eat, the things we drink, the things we put on our skin, the electrical environment that we surround ourselves with, and yes, the unrelenting, you know, go, go, go of modern life because, you know, we have the technology to accomplish so much, now we can't, we can't get away from work. Uh, hence being here lecturing to you at eight o'clock at night. And, um, and the problem is that although our body is meant to take stress and all kinds of stress, it can't be unrelenting stress because we have to, when, when, when these stressors happen, we have to compensate so that we can deal with it. And compensations, you know, say for a, a stuffy nose could be opening your mouth. Um, uh, uh, compensations for not being able to breathe through the behind the uh, the adenoids may be holding your head forward. I mean, there are all kinds of comp baby bottles are compensations, uh, pacifiers are compensations, uh, processed food is a compensation for mothers that had to go back and start working in the factories in the uh, in the 1800s and so forth. So um, the problem is that they always have unintended consequences or compromises. And that's what we're dealing with now. And I'm telling you that this is what we're dealing with when we talk about TM problems, facial pain, clenching and grinding, abfractions, cracked crowns, um, to a good degree, periodontal disease, although that can be linked to the microbiome of both the, the oral cavity and the rest of the digestive tract. Um, uh, the, the, even the way we give birth is, is different now than, than we did uh, years ago, and it changes things. And once you get those unintended consequences, they go around in a certain vicious circle, um, getting worse and worse. Of course, the one we're dealing with uh, at the present moment is this inability to breathe well, where you're supposed to breathe through your nose, air flows through smoothly down the back of your throat and into your lungs. Uh, when we get narrow spots, and we call those starling resistors, the, the narrowness creates turbulence, and the turbulence creates negative pressure, which sucks on the tissue. And if the tissue is, you know, um, uh, um, elastic enough and, and resilient enough, it'll just kind of flutter in the breeze like a, a piece of paper in the wind, and that's, you know, we call snoring. Of course, it could get so bad over the years that there's no resistance at all, and the negative pressure just pulls the tissues together and then the whole airway is blocked off and that's obstructive sleep apnea. But there is a gradation going on from 
the narrowing of the airway all the way through the stoppage of the airway that we call flow limitation. And this is also known as upper airway resistance syndrome. Syndrome because just the, the difficulty in breathing is enough to create stress for our body, even if we don't stop breathing, even if we don't wake up, even if, um, even if there's no drop in oxygen. Just the fact that our, our brain detects that we're having difficulty breathing means we got to do something about it. And very often you can see extreme spikes in heart rate all through the night in someone that, that you know, otherwise thought they sleep just fine. Their fragmented sleep will have an effect on their physiology both daytime and nighttime. Plus, I will say that, the, that many of us have, have picked up habits about breathing that make it almost impossible to breathe well at night. We're breathing a high rate and volume of, of, of air using our chest and shoulders to breathe, heaving, literally our shoulders heave while we breathe. Kids breathing at 25, 31 breaths per minute, they're hyperventilating. And how could they possibly manage to breathe well at night when the muscles go limp and we're laying on our back? This is a problem that far exceeds sleep apnea alone. It's a problem that is happening to, like I say, anybody who's got small jaws and anybody who's got small jaws has crooked teeth. So laminar flow is the goal that is having air pass through a tube without obstruction, turbulent flow is the enemy because it creates negative pressure, pulls the sidewalls in, and makes it harder to breathe, more effort to breathe. Does anybody want to have more effort to breathe? Just test yourself by taking your hand and putting it over your nose and mouth and seeing, you can even leave a little space if you want. I don't want you passing out or anything, Let's just see how long you can keep that up for. Let's see how long you can keep an N95 mask on. How's that? And what creates turbulence? Structure, function, and behavior, not just structure. Um, because uh, like I say, there's more to it than anatomy alone. Let me just look at my, uh, my clock here so I don't, uh, I don't talk too much. Got a few more minutes, Barry, and uh, you you want to take questions? All right. Any time you're ready, but um, all right. Let me see. What I get, I've given them a mouthful. All right. Look, structure, <laughs> function, and behavior. Structure meaning the size and shape of the airway. So yes, I mean, if a fireman came to your house, you'd rather have him have this big hunk of a hose than a little squirt gun, right? Yeah. Having a bigger airway makes it easier for the air to flow. But you also have to look at the stability of the airway, the, the, the things that, that cause swelling or adipose or irritation or inflammation or mucus. These are all things that will affect just how well the, the, uh, the airway will be able to stay open. And then this is the most important thing in my mind because this is really the source of the problem. And the one thing that most dentists are not looking at and that's behavior meaning that the urgency to take the next breath, it's the most important thing we do moment to moment. And anything that threatens it uh, requires a compensation immediately. And those compensations reverberate throughout the body in so many ways from head to toe. It's a long story. Um, so this is the statement that the ADA made and, um, you know, read it, read it quickly. I, I, you could parse it out because there's a lot of real meat to it. But the end of the statement is that it is our job to help develop an optimal physiologic airway and breathing pattern. And that, that's really cr crucial. So what, what do we have to do? We have to make sure that the airway is of decent size and it's unrestricted. We have to make sure that it's stable and resilient by reducing the factors that get in the way. And then finally, we have to teach people how to use the airway properly through the nose with the right minute volume, using the diaphragm, taking in air and exchanging just enough that we need, keeping carbon dioxide levels uh, proper, allowing nitric oxide from the nose and the sinuses to, to flow through the airway and prepare the airway for breathing.
we, uh, we think about sleep apnea as, as being the end stage uh, problem, um, but uh, really, it, uh, well, it is the end stage problem. Uh, it's the modern environmental stressors that lead to the compensations. It's the compensations that if they become habits lead to soft tissue dysfunction. It's the soft tissue dysfunctions the open mouth posture, the low tongue posture, the breathing through the mouth, the, uh, the, the flaccid or hyperactive facial muscles that lead to the change in the skull. And, but when you wait till braces age, my God, all that has already happened and taken place. And now all you're doing is trying not to make the airway worse. And if you're not careful, you probably can. So, um, but in adults, that have either had airway ignorant orthodontics or have not had orthodontics at all, they are in compromise because the inability to deliver oxygen to all parts of the body has effects in every system of the body. Um, the, um, the, the listing of comorbid symptoms on our airway uh, uh, checklist is, is unbelievable if you've never uh, looked at it before. So if you're only taking care of sleep apnea, you are then just taking care of the end stage disease. Now, for every step along the way, there are things that you can do in either improving function or structure or behavior. And it's our job to parse out those things in every step along the way. Uh, let me just finish by uh, saying, well, I got to give my kudos to, uh, to Steve, uh, who's leading this charge in, at the ADA, and I am so proud to be part of his cadre there. We're looking at screening, metrics, getting the word out to the, um, to the dental uh, uh, profession, getting the word out to patients and parents, um, making care accessible, and so forth. So, um, Here's, here's the take home. OSA is not the problem. OSA is the result of the problem. And then finally, our job is to make the airway easier to breathe through easily. Ta-da! Hey. How'd I do? <laughs> did, of, of course you did well. So we have a few really good questions here uh, right. that fit right in nicely with your talk, Barry. And um, Primarily, uh, people want to know uh, kind of how do we approach families? There's some questions about when do we start? Is it less than one? Do we do breathing exercises? And, and very important, I'd really love to hear you say what the dentist can do to talk to their families about a child who has, quote, crooked teeth. And maybe they're not the orthodontist. And so, so they say, well, should I take my kid to the orthodontist and, and talk about a little bit about how you help the family set up that successful treatment. Yeah, so there are many approaches to this. One is that you have to start screening and just get a, a hold of the screening form. I'm sure, Steve, is it ready for, for distribution no, yet? No, the new one's not yet. All right, so you look around and it, Steve will write one up for you. Uh, <laughs> you know, just, it, just five simple questions that your hygienist will ask at your recall appointments and, um, and then familiarize yourself with it. I'll recommend two books that I think are really great. I, I actually, I can recommend 10, but start with these two. One is called Gasp by Gelbin Hinden, uh, available on Amazon. Uh, it goes into the comorbidities of airway and breathing problems. The other one is Jaws, um, the story of a hidden epidemic. It's by uh, epidemic. It is by a, um, a, a, um, a population biologist and an orthodontist working together. In fact, they have a new tome coming out that's going to be also interesting. Read those and, and, um, uh, and, and, and that'll give you a way of talking about the problem. Um, the, um, the other thing is that as you educate yourself, you need to educate the people you're going to work with and you're going to need to find an orthodontist that is willing to listen to this story. If they don't want to listen, don't make them. Because they, especially if they're very successful at what they do, 
and they're very good at pushing teeth around, they're not going to be particularly interested. But there are old and young orthodontists alike all over the country who have kids who are having problems, who see these problems in their own patients, uh, or who have mothers that are begging them to do this, that have to learn about it. In fact, I was I was on uh, 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 on the on the web with uh, Dwayne Grummans today, um, someone that Steve knows very well. Dwayne and I are working with this group called the American Academy of Physiologic Medicine and Dentistry to address these things to orthodontists so that they can start to understand it. It's, it there's, it's not really that magic or secret. And the, the knowledge has been out there. In fact, every orthodontist will say, oh yeah, I knew that. But they know that, but they don't do that. So um, you, you, gotta, you gotta start having conversations. Have conversations with ENTs too. Have conversations with allergists and pediatricians. And then get to, get to know a myofunctional therapist. Um, they, they are invaluable in helping you evaluate your patients and so forth. I'm glad you brought up the AAPMD because that's certainly a good organization that's helping lead all this going forward as well. Yeah. What I tell my families uh, when somebody asks about this, I had this conversation today, is to uh, go to the orthodontist and say, tell me how this treatment is going to help my child breathe better. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have an answer for that, then you're at the wrong orthodontist. And so, um, so I, I just think that's important. That's a couple it. of other questions. So, so we, we spent a lot of time, of course, getting uh, kids off on the right track. But what about those narrow palates? You showed a 40, what, two-year-old man with a, a, that narrow yeah. palate because it doesn't yeah. grow, go away. Yeah. So what about those? What about the 50-year-olds? How far into their adult life can you expand that? And does it do any good? Right. So the, you can. I, there's lots that you can do. Um, if you address form, function, and behavior, you can, there's lots that you can do for people at any age. For form, I mean, it may be surgically that we have to help the alveolus spread out. We've got some great techniques for that that can make tongue space within months now um, using surgically facilitated periodontal, uh, periodontal um, osseous acceleration procedures. Um, we can do orthognathic surgery to bring both jaws forward. In fact, Orthognathic surge by maxillary advancement surgery is the most successful treatment for sleep apnea there is. Now, though it's rather radical, I, I say this because it is also an object lesson. If the jaws coming forward cure sleep apnea in adults, why shouldn't we help be helping jaws grow forward in children in the first place? Wonderful. Yeah. What about uh, a few questions there about enuresis? Yeah. So there, there are a number of reasons why kids will pee in bed at night. Um, and a lot of them are related to airway. Um, one of them says that when you're over breathing, as you tend to do when your mouth is open, you expel too much carbon dioxide. And over a period of time, your, your base levels of CO2 go down. I know most sleep physicians are worried about hypercapnia. But I see a lot of kids come in, and I measure it in the office. They come in hypocapnic. And one of the things that CO2 does is it regulates smooth muscle tone. So if you're low in CO2, smooth muscle goes into spasm. It leads to things like uh, constricted arteries, so it's high blood pressure, um, to constricted bronchioles, so that's asthma, to uh, constricted uh, bladders, and that, that can be enuresis. There's also some effects of um, uh, um, uh, the activation of the HPA axis at night, you know, adrenaline dumps while you're supposed to be sleeping, you know, you're not being chased by some tiger or anything. Uh, you're supposed to sleep peacefully, but you know, you're, you're, if you're having trouble breathing, that's reason enough to get scared. And so that, that, that all plays into, and there's some others too. Well, a couple of things with, related to that. Somebody mentioned on a chat here, uh, Patrick McCowan's books and studying with him. So I know you've been studying with him as well. That, that relates to that oxygen CO2 balance, right? Yes, exactly. There are yeah. three gases we pay attention to now. One is oxygen, of course. Now we're really paying attention to CO2 and where your habits have brought you to. 
so that it's also a good indicator of you improving your habits. And the other one's nitric oxide. Nitric oxide produced in the sinuses is a vasodilator. It's an a bacteriostat. And if you're breathing through your nose, it's drawn out of the sinuses into the breath, breathe air down the back of your throat into the, the lungs helps, uh, helps you breathe better. Um, and um, so that now we're looking at three gases there. Yeah, it's hard to measure the nitric oxide, but, uh, but we can measure the other two in the offices uh, yeah. pretty easily, yeah. yeah. Um, and but Patrick McCown's book, uh, The Oxygen Advantage, is an excellent book to study uh, with this. Like Barry said, there's, there's dozens, a uh, dozen books that, that can be used for that. And um, I, I know at the Panky course, we're going to be talking about all those kind of resources as well. So there's some links to the Panky Air, upcoming Panky Airway course, Advanced Airway course coming on there too. Mm -hmm. So uh, Barry, our, our buddy Kev uh, talks about uh, uh, orthodox reluctance to see small children. So as you, what, what does your crystal ball show for this uh, time frame for getting started? on these kids. Right. So my buddy Kev is Kevin Boyd, pediatric dentist out of Chicago, um, who is a brother in arms to me and has been since uh, we met some eight or 10 years ago. Uh, obviously, he's a pediatric dentist. And so he has no trouble working with two-year-olds uh, to get them started and get the jaws start getting, uh, you know, reformed and properly reformed. Uh, Again, me, I'm down to about four years of age. Um, I think as a, I, I get into intraoral scanning, when we get a nice tiny camera, uh, I'll go a little bit lower. You know, it's, it's hard taking an impression on a two-year-old uh, that's not sedated. But um, yeah, to him, the seven-year-old that the orthodontic association says is when you're first supposed to see the orthodontist, that's a geriatric to uh, to my buddy. <laughs> so so talk about adult orthodontics for sleep apnea. Does that work? Well, yeah. I mean, look again, structure, function, and behavior. First of all, anybody can be taught to breathe easily. Secondly, secondly, and and the, and there are there are PhDs that are doing that. There's a a, a group. It's not Buteco. It's maybe a little more sophisticated, but. There are breathing physiologists that will work with patients, especially if you, if you get really tightness in the chest, panic attacks, um, you know, all kinds of dysfunctional breathing that we, we attribute to our mental state. They really may be, the mental state may be a reflection of the physical state. Um, you can do lots to reduce the, the risk factors like inflammation and swelling. And I mean, yeah, I, it requires change in behavior. I certainly know myself how, how, hard that can be. And then there are the things you can do to change anatomy. I, I think one of the things that we should talk about for adults is this. You can and should, with your patients, learn how to mitigate some of their sleep problems um, non-invasively first and prove to them using medical metrics that they can feel better if they sleep better. If you can get someone to a point where they recognize that, oh my God, I was walking around exhausted and now I can breathe and I feel, I wake up refreshed, then selling those kinds of more invasive procedures becomes less onerous. So you're not going to talk somebody into maxillomandibular surgery if they don't think they want it. But if you change somebody's life, they may beg you for it. 